Good morning, church. Good morning. From time immemorial, many had, uh, have had a uh, messianic claim. And uh, none of them survived the test of time, the test of grace, and the test of truth. Except, of course, for only one individual, and that is the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And up until this very moment, he still reigns. You know, when, when Peter was before the, the high court, Sanhedrin, they were enraged by Peter's testimony about Jesus Christ and with the other the apostles with, with him. And the Sanhedrin, they resolved to put the apostles to death. They decided to put them to death. But somebody stood up and uh, stood up before the Sanhedrin and reasoned out with them and gave his opinion on the matter. They listened to Gamaliel. This particular person who stood up was Gamaliel. And uh, Gamaliel said, but a Pharisee in Acts chapter 5, verses 34, 36 to 39, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin. Some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Then after him, Judas the Galilean appeared. He too perished, and all of his followers were scattered. Leave this man alone, let them go. For if their purpose or endeavor is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. Then eventually, the high court listened to Gamaliel. Now, before letting go of the apostles, they were uh, whipped first. They were flagged, and then uh, before letting them go, they were warned not to speak again of the name Jesus. Well, but of course, the apostles never stopped talking about Jesus. You know, they went out, they were rejoicing, and they just cannot keep their mouth shut. In Acts chapter 5, 41, 42, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they, had been in, that they had been counted worthy of the suffering, disgrace for the name. Every day, every day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. On one occasion, Thomas wanted to make sure that what the, uh, what the other apostles were saying was indeed true when they told him they had seen Jesus Christ alive. They had seen Jesus Christ resurrected. Now, Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails have been and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Then after eight days, Jesus appeared to them again, and this time Thomas was there. And Jesus let him touch his hands, and Jesus let him touch his side, and said to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Then Thomas said one of the famous lines in the Bible as his personal testimony about Jesus. He said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Today we will start um, another series uh, of lessons about Jesus. And the serious lesson would be my Lord and my God. We will talk about who is Jesus, his life, his Godship, and the importance of Jesus to our lives. Why do we need Jesus Christ? 
And this morning, we will start off by answering one of the most important questions about Jesus. And which brings so much, I would say, controversy. And that question is, is Jesus God? We will answer that this morning. So our lesson this morning, Jesus is God, proving his Godship. Now the first question would be, did Jesus ever claim to be God? Okay. There are those who said one reason why they didn't believe or they don't believe in Jesus to be God because Jesus himself never claimed to be God. So that's why they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Did Jesus really never claim to be God? In John chapter 10, verses 30 to 33, I and the Father are one. At this, the Jews again pick up stones to stone him. But Jesus responded, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me for? We are not stoning you for any good work, said the Jews, but for blasphemy. Because you, who are a man, declare yourself to be God. Did Jesus ever claim to be God? When the Jews started picking up stones to stone Jesus, Jesus said, wait up, wait. Which of the many good works that I did to you that you are stoning me for? But the Jews, they knew ex exactly the meaning when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Okay. They knew exactly what's the meaning of that. If we are reading, if we would be reading this particular words of Jesus Christ today, probably we won't understand the meaning of that. We would probably say, Jesus never said, I am God. Well, of course, we could never read those particular words in these verses. But during that time, the context, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, the Jews knew what he meant, that Jesus claims to be God. Now in verse 33, the Jews said, we are stoning you not for your good works, but for blasphemy, because you who are men declare, you claim yourself to be God. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, it was his claim to God in Godship. It was his claim, it was his declaration that he is God. In Mark chapter 14, in our scripture reading, we could read that the high priest, he tore his clothes. The question is, but why? But why? He probably knew the meaning of those words uttered by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was actually quoting an Old Testament uh, verses. He was quoting Daniel chapter 7. Okay. When Jesus when but Jesus remained silent and made no reply. Again, the high priest questioned him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At this, the high priest tore his clothes and declared, Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your verdict? And they all condemned him as the serving of Death. Would you turn with me in the book of Daniel, 
chapter 7, verse 9. And as we go along, we will have some definition of terms along the way. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, As I continued to watch, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His glory was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. Now notice the word ancient of days. Ancient of days is a term referring to God. From the word ancient, which means that existed long before. Ancient of days, therefore, means existing long before time began. In Genesis chapter 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that includes time. God created time, therefore God existed before time, and therefore called the ancient of days. And also, we, we saw and we read a while ago the term Son of Man. And you will see the Son of Man. The term Son of Man, it was mentioned 80 plus times in the New Testament. The Son of Man was only, only given reference to Jesus. There was no other individual that was referred to as the Son of Man. Only it was only to Jesus Christ. Now, it was a claim to the divine authority of Jesus as it is the fulfillment of prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So when the priest heard the testimony of Jesus, he tore his clothes because he knew what Jesus meant, and it was a claim to Godship. In Daniel chapter 7, Verses 13 and 14, and this is where Jesus quoted his words in Mark, in the book of Mark that we read a while ago. Daniel, in his vision, in my vision in the night, I continued to watch. And I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He, the Son of Man, approached the ancients of this. So we see here, Daniel saw two beings, all right? He saw the Son of Man. The Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And this Son of Man, he approached the Ancient of Days that we saw in Daniel chapter 6 already seated at his throne. So the Son of Man approaching and coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. Now, we go first to what is mean with the clouds of heaven. Clouds of heaven, in the Old Testament, only God comes in clouds of heaven. You know, in the Old Testament, they only knew one God, and they normally refer to it as Yahweh. In the Old Testament, only God comes in clouds of heaven. It represents the presence of God. And we could see that in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, uh, during the, uh, uh, the exile or the exodus of the Israelites after they left Egypt. By, by day, the Lord went ahead of them in pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 8, when the priest came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. Now, the priest went out of the temple after they, they have put the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. So when they went out, a thick cloud, a thick cloud filled the temple. Now, in verses 11 and 12 of 1 Kings chapter 8, we read the following. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. Now, we 
could read with other so many verses out there that the glory of God was there in the clouds and that God dwells in it. Now, these verses tells us the presence of God in the clouds. So when in the Old Testament in, or in the Bible, when they saw the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, it only the clouds of heaven only pertains to God. But here is the Son of Man. Here is the Ancient of Days. They call God. And this the Ancient of Man, another being, coming in the clouds of heaven, which only, which only God would come and can come, could come. Ancient of days, seated at his throne, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven approaching the ancient of days. Now, if those who claim that there is only one God and that Jesus is not God, now how do we reconcile the ancient of days, God, in this side, and comes another God, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven, approaching the ancient of days. It could not be the ancient of days coming to himself. But the Bible is clear that the ancient of days is seated at his throne and then another being, which is God, coming in the clouds of heaven, termed as the Son of Man, approaching the ancients of days. Now clearly, Jesus is God. And again, if you go back to Mark chapter 14, you could see the declaration of Jesus quoting Daniel chapter 7. Now the priest knew in Mark chapter 14 that the term Son of Man refers to God and Jesus claimed to be that. Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man and they could not accept it and that's why the verdict for Jesus was death. Going back to Daniel chapter 7, now we could read, he was given, the Son of Man was given dominion, glory, and kingship. Now dominion, glory, and kingship. These were only given reference to God. Now Yahweh, we see the qualities attributed to him in First Chronicles chapter 29, 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Dominion, glory, and kingship only pertains to God, as we, as we have read. Now, if this were only um, attributed to God, we have seen in Daniel chapter 7 that this Son of Man was given dominion, glory, and kingship. Now, to satisfy the skeptics, we go to the uh, testimony of Jude. Now, Jude, guided by the Holy Spirit, attributed all these qualities to a certain being. In Jude chapter 1, verse 25, to God, to God, and who is that God? Our Savior. We don't need to be Bible scholar to understand and to know who the Savior is. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 
You see, Jude attributed all those characteristics to God. And who is that God? Savior. And who is that Savior? Jesus Christ. Going back to Daniel chapter 7. Now you could see the word in red, serve him. That the people of every nation and language should serve him. Should serve the son of man. To serve or worship from the word pelak is an Aramaic term which is rendered latruo in Greek. This term was only used in the Old Testament for serving or worshiping God. This term is only reserved to God. And whenever they use the word pelak or pelak, and Latrua in Greek, it has reference to worshiping. It has reference to serving God. And with more than, I believe, 100 or more times uh, in usage in the Old Testament, when Pelak was used, again, it was only used for God, for worshiping, for serving God. Now, according to Daniel 7, now comes this one like the Son of Man, whom people of all nations and languages would serve, would worship. Now, this kind of worship is only to God. Now, here comes another being, the Son of Man, who is to be worshipped and will be worshipped, the same as the ancient of this. Therefore, making the Son of Man God. And certainly the priest understood that God should only be the one to be worshipped. But here Jesus claimed worship and therefore is God. That's why again the verdict of the priest and those who were, who were with him is death for Jesus Christ. Going back to Daniel chapter 7 in verse 14. After serving him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Now, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. It only, again, refers to God because of his majesty, because of his glory, because of his power. That word only pertains to God. Now, in the following verses that we will look at, that aside from God, that they know of in the Old Testament, there is another one that shares this kind of majesty, that shared or shares this kind of power. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing, the honor, the glory, and what? Dominion forever and ever. Now, Revelation 5.13, now here is John telling us of two deities. Two deities. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Two deities. He was talking about two beings. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. In Psalm 47.8, again, aside from Daniel chapter 6, who is it that sits on the throne? God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. Now, who is the Lamb of God? In, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, we can see the Son of Man is God for His dominion, is an everlasting dominion, and Jesus shares this with the Father. To Him who sits on the throne, referring to God the Father and to the Lamb, the glory, honor, blessing, and dominion forever and ever. Jesus 
being God, shares the dominion with his father. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Again, pertaining to the Son of Man. This Son of Man will have his kingdom. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 6, verse 26. I, not kind Darius, sorry, King Darius, I, King Darius, hereby decree that in every part of my kingdom, men are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion will never end. King Darius issued a decree after God rescued Daniel from the lion's den. Now, certainly, when he mentioned the word God, for sure, King Darius wasn't referring to Jesus Christ. He didn't know about Jesus Christ at the time. They only knew one God, and they referred to him normally as Yahweh. Now, look at what he said of God. He is the living God, and he endures forever, his kingdom will be destroyed. Oh, his kingdom will never be destroyed. Now, it is a, a declaration for God. And he, he, he was right. Darius was right when he declared that God indeed is a living God. And he endures forever. Now, all those things only pertain to God. And Darius was clear about that. Now, the fact that the name God in this verse is Eloah, in Hebrew or Ella, Aramaic, it was used singular, God. All right? Unlike in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the name God that was used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, was Elohim which is plural for God. If you will read Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the word God is or was Elohim, plural. But when Darius used the word God, he was referring to only one God because, again, they only knew one God. Now, having only knew one God, remember when Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross and about to die, with a loud voice, he shouted, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, when he was referring to God. And Eli is also an Aramaic term for God, singular, similar to the word Ella. So it is clear that God, in reference to Daniel chapter 6, his kingdom will never be destroyed, refers to God the Father. As we know it, right? Now comes chapter 7 of Daniel. Where in the, in the vision of Daniel, this one, like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven, also has a kingdom. Has a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Same as with that of God the Father which they only knew that only God could have a kingdom that can never be destroyed. Only God could have that. But in Daniel chapter 7, this son of man also had a kingdom that will never be destroyed, meaning the son of God also is God. Now, when we say that the son of man has a kingdom, Jesus Christ, he was, they were mocking him as the king of the Jews. No. Now remember that the son of man was given, uh, was given dominion, glory, and kingship. Now a king wouldn't be a king without a kingdom. 
So that is why in Daniel chapter 7, they, he said that he saw that this son of man would have a kingdom that will never be destroyed. In Daniel chapter 2, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, this is believed to be the prophecy of the church. Now, when was this set up? It says the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. When? When would this happen? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near or at hand. Okay. Now, John the Baptist said that the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand. It means it wasn't established yet, but it is coming. Now comes Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. If you would see the declaration of Jesus building his church in verse 18, and then in verse 19, he calls it what? The kingdom of heaven. So when Daniel chapter 7 mentioned that the Son of Man with dominion, glory, and kingship will have a kingdom that will never be destroyed, he was referring to the prophecy that he mentioned earlier in Daniel chapter 2, which pertains to the church, the kingdom of Jesus Christ that will never be destroyed. Now, all of these things, without going any further, talking about the church, pointed to Jesus Christ as the one having a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Now, the priest, again, hated Jesus for this because he was making himself equal with God for having an equal kingdom that will never be destroyed with that of God. So again, their verdict for Jesus Christ was death. Now going back again in Mark chapter 14, 62 and 63. We could read, sitting at the right hand of power. Now, power here is referred, referred to God, sitting at the right hand of God, who has supreme power, who has supreme authority. You know, during the, the medieval, medieval times, you know, with kings and queens, the one who sat beside the king meant that the person was a co-ruler, meant that the person who sat beside the king is co-heir, given supreme power, given authority to redeem and to judge. Now, therefore, whatever glory, whatever honor and authority and power due to God is due to the Son of Man also, because the Son of Man was sitting at the right hand of God. So both of them, those who sit on the throne and those who sit beside the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, shared the glory, the honor, and authority, and power. And this position can only be occupied by someone whose nature is God. And it cannot be occupied by a, a creation by God. Now, in the Bible, no one or nobody is ever depicted to be seated at the right hand of power. Not even Abraham, not even Moses, not even Solomon, not even David. Only the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, at the right hand of God. And it is only Jesus Christ. Now, the proof that Jesus indeed is that person sitting at the right hand of power. In Acts chapter 2, verse 30, But he, David, was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. In Matthew 22, 42, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Now, what's happening here? Very quick, 
quickly. What's happening here? When Jesus asked the Pharisees who they think the Messiah is, now, Jesus, without referring to himself as the Messiah, the Pharisees said, the son of David. The son of David, Matthew chapter 22. Now, true enough. The answer was true because in Acts chapter 2, verse 30, it was promised to David that the Messiah would come from his lineage, from his descendants. Okay? The one who would sit on the throne of God, which was a reference to the Messiah. Now, the son of David simply means descendant of David. All right? Now, David is here and Jesus is here. 100 years apart. The Pharisees knew that soon after David, the Messiah would come. Now, let's continue. Matthew 22. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? With reference to Psalm 110 verse 1 in Acts chapter 2, 34 and 35. Okay. Now, Jesus was kind of giving his thoughts to the Pharisees. It was in a way of a question. Now, the flow of thoughts of Jesus here is, wait a minute. If you are calling the son of, the son of David as the Messiah, then David calls him Lord. Why is that? Okay. David okay, calls him Lord. Then the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord said to my Lord, Adonai, or Master, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, it follows that this Messiah is more than the physical descent of David. Okay. To be seated at the right hand of God. And to be seated at the right hand of God, again, denotes deity. So therefore, this son of man or this Messiah is both human and divine. And there's always more. The Pharisees only knew that the Messiah would come in the future. Meaning, here's David. The Pharisees knew that the Messiah would come in the future. All right? In the future. Now, how was it then that David, when he was alive, he, was, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, referring to the Messiah. If he was only a descendant by birth of David. How could the Messiah be alive when David was alive? How could that be? The Pharisees again only knew of the Messiah in the future. Again, the only logical explanation to that would be this Messiah is both human and divine. Now, let us hear what Jesus said. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. From the time that Abraham was born, Abraham is here, and from the birth of David, there, was one, there were 1,125 years or more difference between them. Abraham is here, David is here, 1,125 years apart. Abraham existed long before David. All right? But Jesus said, before Abraham, I am. Before David, I am. Before Abraham, I am. Jesus already existed. Foreseeing this, <clears throat> David spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his body see decay. David himself testified that this Christ, his descendant, would be resurrected. Now Peter finally revealed the name 
of this Messiah. Hold your breath. In verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, to which we are all witnesses. Even David testified that this Messiah would be resurrected. And who is this Messiah? Peter said, Jesus Christ. Now finally comes verse 33. Peter said, this Jesus was exalted then to the right hand of God. With all of these facts, with all of these things in front of us, clearly the one sitting at the right hand of power at the right side of God is Jesus. Again, no one ever seated at the right hand of God except Jesus. And no one ever was called the Son of Man except Jesus Christ. Those are some of the references. Sit at my right hand, Psalm 110, verse 1. Sit at my right hand, Matthew 22, 44. Sit at my right hand, Acts 2, 34 and 35. All pertains to Jesus Christ. Now, brethren and friends, Jesus is God. Amen to that. Amen to that. I won't be standing here in front of you if Jesus is not God. I won't be here today. But because Jesus is God, we are all here today declaring our faith, devotion, and love to Jesus Christ because he is indeed truly God. They hated Jesus not because of his good deeds. They hated Jesus because he claimed to be God. In the light of the scriptures, I hope that all of us would see indeed without any shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. The gospel is yours. I call upon those who have been listening to the words of God, who believe in your heart that Jesus is God, who died for you to cleanse you of your sins. We ask that you come today and accept Jesus, repent of your sins, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, as you make the decisions to come forward, shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation. Good morning.